morning, everybody. This is Rachel Haney with uh, Central Indiana Real Estate Investors Association, also known as Cyria. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Mike Fallow, who is one of the owners of MM Lending, who is also uh, one of the premier vendors for Cyria. So good morning, Mike. How are you doing today? Hey, Rachel. I'm doing great. Glad to be here. Excellent. And can you tell me where you're at? You're in Kentucky, is that correct? Yes, our uh, main office is based in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And that's where we operate out of, and I'm in our office today. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So, uh, MM Lending, tell me a little bit about uh, your company and what you guys sure, do. Sure, sure. So, MM Lending, we are a private lender. We've been in business uh, since 2005, um, and we loan to real estate investors uh, uh, for traditional fix and flip loans, and uh, some of them, all, some of our funding is also used for fix and rent. All of our loans are short-term loans and provide both for purchase money and rehab money. Uh, we operate kind of in the traditional median house price range. Our loans in, in size range from you know fifty thousand to three hundred thousand dollars, but the majority of the houses that we fund would sell for somewhere between $100,000 and $350,000. Okay. So, um, so in 2005, how have, how, what are some of the big transitions that you've seen? From well, it's, I mean, the, the, the housing business, flipping business and lending business has changed, you know, dramatically over the last 15 years. Uh, we were in business for a few years before the, the 2008, 2010 meltdown occurred. Um, survive through that, um, and uh, now the the investing and flipping business is a much more sophisticated business. Uh, you know, groups like Cyria have done a great job of providing education and training. The skill level and the quality of investors is is significantly better than what he, what it used to be, and the volume of properties that go through a process of of transformation through a flip is significant, very important to the housing market in, in the country as a whole. Um, you know, some of the things that we've seen probably the most is that um, the, the, the current generation of buyers are very particular about houses. So it used to be that houses didn't have to be finished to a certain degree and people would kind of accept what was on the market. Now, buyers in general are very particular, which creates a terrific opportunity for investors to take old properties and uh, renovate them. Uh, the other factor that that, that uh, really impacts the investing business in our business is that the housing stock in the markets that we operate, Indianapolis, Louisville, and Cincinnati, is generally a pretty old housing stock. Many, many houses are 60 to 100 years old, and they're in great areas. Uh, they have great bones, but they need a lot of either structural work and or cosmetic work and or transformation to get their floor plan to be workable within today's uh, demands. And so, you know, there's not, uh, investors are the primary group of people that go out and do all that work and take old tired houses and convert them into to, to almost brand new livable functioning properties. So the investing business kind of gone from to people that used to buy houses just at foreclosure, throw some paint and carpet in them, fix them up and clean them up and sell them or rent them out into a very sophisticated business model. Right. Did you get a chance to see a lot of the before and after photos of some of the investors that you help? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, always, that's always kind of great to see. And one of the things that we do when we have a new investor come to us, we like to see their portfolio of work, what they have done. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, in the median house price range, creativity is not nearly as important as good solid execution. You know, um, you don't have to be a leader in design standards, but you do have to be a very high quality oriented investor to be successful at, at being able to, you know, get the work done, get it done quickly, get it done correctly at the right price and sell it and have happy buyers. Uh, what we see a lot of times is that um, investors get, something 95% done, 98% done in the last five or five percent or so of the project really depletes the profit out of the project because they spend tons of money fixing things to get them to the hundred uh, percent. But yeah, so the before and after pictures are always, are always great to see. Yeah. Uh, so how are you different than a traditional bank? Well, so uh, the only way, the only thing that we really share in common with the bank is that we, quote, loan money. 
mm-hmm. the, the customer base that we serve, the way that we loan money, the risk levels that we take and the service that we provide, and, and the rates and fees that we charge are all dramatically different than a conventional bank. Banks are highly regulated and structured and cookie cutter. And so the transactions have to really conform to what that bank has to offer. And what that bank has to offer conforms to what the government says they, they can do. So it's a very rigid kind of a format. In our mm-hmm. case, as a private lender, we set our own standards, we set our own processes. And so we really look to, to serve the investor market. So there's a couple things about that. One is speed and available is, is speed, just primarily speed, being able to get to a closing. Uh, we can close loans in seven to 10 days. As soon as there's clean title, um, you know, we're pretty much ready to close. Uh, most distressed transactions need to move very quickly because the buyer needs, needs to get that money. And that's typically where the best deals are. So banks are generally much slower to close uh, than us. Um, the second thing is the structuring. Um, you know, banks have generally rigid guidelines. We have fairly flexible guidelines. We do have loan to value ranges that we want to uh, meet. But in terms of how we actually get that done, we can be a little more creative. Um, the other thing is as the, as the rehab is going on, we fund that rehab in a series of draws, that is loan funds that we provide to the borrower as that rehab process is progressing. We fund loan draws on the same day that our borrower requests them. And again, a, a bank would be much slower uh, to do that. Um, our, we'll typically loan more money on a project than a bank would loan. Um, and a bank's rates would be less than ours because they're going to generally take less risk. Banks are generally more geared towards traditional financial metrics like credit scores, debt to income, loan to value. We're generally more geared to an investor's experience. Um, you know, we, and, and to use a horse racing analogy, since we're at home of the Kentucky Derby, we bet on the jockey. We're really, we're really relying on that investor to really be able to deliver that through a variety of difficult circumstances. Mm-hmm. We're betting on the character and the integrity and the knowledge and skill of that investor to get it done. Right. Okay. So, um, so basically what you're saying is the more experience that an individual has investing or, or the, um, as the rapport has been built with you guys personally, basically it gets easier with each yeah. transaction. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, you know, because it, it is a relationship and, and um, you know, it, it's, it's very difficult for someone who has never done a project before you know, for us to, to determine, are they going to be successful or not? Do they have the minimum characteristics or not? It's very difficult. We don't have a test we can give them to see, do they pass the test or whatever. So if you don't have experience, but you have financial qualifications, it's, it's, a, it's you know, then we can often work with a first time investor. But for the most part, particularly right now during the COVID-19 environment, we're looking for investors that have some experience because investors need to be very experienced and pliable during this time to adapt to the changing circumstances. And so new investors may or may not have that ability to adapt and that, that, that overall situational awareness to know what to do and how to do it you know, quickly. So right, we're typically right. working with experienced investors right now. Okay. Um, so I, I kind of not know which group of individuals typically reach out to you. So we have, um, uh, you know, a really a pretty broad variety of, uh, of individuals that we work with. Um, we're, we like to work with repeat borrowers. And those are, those are individuals or groups that would do anywhere from one or two flips a year to 30 to 50 flips a year. And, um, you know, we, because we establish that relationship, uh, we're very fluid in how we work with a borrower. So, um, the, uh, the application process is a one-time thing up front, but then every time they have a new property that they'd like us to finance, that can all be done pretty much via email or text. We take care of all the details on our end. So it's, it's very much a working, you know, good, close working relationship like that. Uh, we do get a fair amount of new investors that reach out to us. Um, some of those we can work with. Some of those don't have the minimum standards or skills or financial qualifications. And so we'll, well, oftentimes we'll give them some guidance and say, you either need a financial partner or you need to get some, some education. One of the factors that we look at for an investor is if they are a member of a real estate investor association, how active they've been, how long they've been involved. Because usually when, when folks are coming to us and they've been a part of an investor, a REA group, 
Uh, they've taken advantage of some of the training programs. Um, they, they've met some other members. They, they have people they can rely on. They have a network of support people that can help them. All of that stuff is really important to us when we look at how do we get a new person. Experienced people typically bring that to the table because they've, they've, they've had contacts and they've, they've met you know, contractors and suppliers and wholesalers and all kinds of people. Uh, but, but new people, typically we want to see that they're working through a REA group to, to, uh, to get that experience. That's really good to know for individuals who are starting. Um, but yeah, being a part of any uh, any type of RIA definitely does show how serious somebody is um, in right. becoming a real estate investor. You know, that definitely yeah. helps. Yeah, so like if somebody calls us and, and they were, you know, they were talking to some friends and, and watching a, one of the flip, flip This House shows and they decided on Monday that they want to get into the business and they call us, and they haven't really done any homework at that point. They don't know much about the business, but they're just calling to try to borrow some money. They're, they're a little ahead of, uh, or they're behind where they need to be to talk to us. And they're a little ahead of themselves and getting to lender. So what they really need to do is find out what are my strengths and weaknesses? What do I, what do I need to know that I don't know? What kind of resources are out there that I can, um, you know, can take advantage of. And so we like to see that they've already made an investment in time and energy. Yeah. Time is, a, is a very inexpensive resource, but you got to invest your time in it. That's, that's the hard part. And, and, and the more significant yeah. part. So if they've been doing that for a couple of years or even for a year, typically they're you know, way ahead of the game of somebody that has. Right. Anything. Right. Yeah. That was the next question was for people who have never used a hard money lending company, what advice would you give them? So one of them is get involved with some sort of RIA. Um, yes. Yeah, you know, and, and I think, you know, what's happening right now demonstrates the value of education and knowledge and networking in the real estate business. Is that you have a network of people that can give you their side of, of, what, of what they view as happening out there, give you some strategies. Uh, but yeah, so if you haven't worked with a hard money lender before, the things that we'd recommend is, number one, always be prepared to present yourself in a professional way, in a concise way to say, what is your experience? that's relevant to what you're trying to achieve. What is the plan that you're trying to achieve? What, what kind of houses are, are you looking to flip? Are you looking to be a landlord? What does your team look like? Um, do you have a team? Um, and then what, what do you look like financially? What's your financial picture look like? And then how would you model out and present, this is a deal I want to present to you rather than just, some people would might just present and just kind of throw it all on the table and expect us to put the pieces together and then show them this is how it works. We prefer to have somebody else say, hey, this is a deal I'm looking at. This is the this is the rehab budget. This is the after repair value. This is how much profit I can make. Here's how much money I can put into it. Here's my team. If they come to the table with all that, they're much more likely to be able to get a deal funded with us or, or with any, any other hard money. Because in the end, as a lender, we have to get that information. So if we have to put it together ourselves and pull it out, uh, it, it means that the, the borrower has probably a lot less likely chance of getting the deal done than right. if they added all that information. Right. So, so everyone needs to do due diligence in their homework. Yeah, Prior be prepared. Presenting you their idea of how to be successful with this. Um, all right. So last question of the day. What things do you foresee happening as an effect of COVID with hard money lending? Well, you know, the first part would be we're not exactly sure because it's really still unfolding. But what we've seen happen so far is that a lot of the of the funding uh, that private lenders use to, to loan to investors comes from the capital markets. And those would be from sophisticated sources, typically Wall Street type sources, uh, you know, private equity funds. Um, and that money is is a strategic fund just like a mutual fund would be. They could like, they would buy and sell a stock. The capital markets will turn off investments in real estate at the drop of a hat, which many of them did at the inception of COVID-19. So there a lot of the money, it's kind of like a, a tsunami. It comes in, it goes out. And that would be some of the large, large lenders, which have really provided a lot of liquidity in the market in the past. But now a lot of that has moved out. Those, those uh, funds are generally tied to, to more to bank like type underwriting where they're very rigid and have specific guidelines because they deal with a with a very large quantity of loans so they can't really do it customized for each particular borrower so that side of the market has really 
suffered a lot, I think, in, in the COVID-19 because so much of that money was pulled out and it's, some of it's starting to come back in. Private lenders like us, we have our own funds um, that we have some, you know, our own capital that we have invested in the business. Uh, we have bank money that comes in. We have some private individuals, family offices. So we basically control our funds. So we didn't have any, any impact on our funding as a result of COVID-19. So funding-wise, I think investors can look to see that there's going to be less available money. Money Term-wise, uh, terms are going to get tighter as, mm-hmm. as they should. We view that it's, it's wise to take a five to, five to 10% haircut on expected values, given the uncertainty. So far, we haven't really seen a pullback in values at all. Um, but we're, we're, we're advising our borrowers, and we're doing it ourselves, that assume there's a five to 10% pullback in values. Make sure you're well capitalized and you can weather a drop in value like that. And it's still a good deal. If it's not, maybe you should sit on the sidelines for a little bit before you go back in. Um, the, the median price house market is in very good shape right now. Um, the, the inventory has dropped. Number of buyers has dropped. But it's still a seller's market in, in all the markets that we operate in. And we think that's going to be true for a while based upon the limited horizon that we have right now, assuming that the, that there is some kind of a medical resolution for the COVID-19 crisis, either therapeutics or a vaccine, and that that happens sometime in the next year, and that sometime in the next six to nine months, we have some visibility into that. And good news, you can see how the stock market reacted yesterday to the good news about the vaccine, that we can, we can weather the current circumstances you know, in the economy for a while, but not for a long time. And if there is no hope for therapeutics or, 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 or a vaccine, then I kind of all bets are going to be off on that front. But uh, that's not what we think is going to happen. We think that the uh, lack of supply in the median house price range gives a very large cushion to that market. And that'll sustain us for the next three to four months or so, I think. And, uh, you know, past that, um, we're, we think that there will be some some breakthroughs on whether it's therapeutics or a vaccine that will sustain us for the next six to nine months. And uh, we'll see how the reopening goes in, in all the states as well. I mean, that's important to see if we don't have, if we have another surge and we have to shut stuff down, the market's going to change. So um, I wish we had a better crystal ball than that. Uh, but we're fortunate this time that the real estate market was exceptionally healthy on the investor side and the seller side, maybe not so much on the buyer side. Um, and, uh, you know, going into this, that's going to provide a, a very large cushion to get through this. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's, uh, it definitely is. We, we wish we could see, foresee what exactly is going to happen, but uh, we're just going to do our best to um, make the best out of the situation. Uh, you're stating that it is still a seller's market right now, despite yeah. the story, yeah. uh, it's a seller's market. So that's definitely good to hear on one aspect of an investor. So. Yeah, still still a seller's market, which means that there's upward price pressure on properties because there's more buyers than there are properties right now. And uh, with the uh, tapering off of interest rates, um, houses are cheaper to buy long term because uh, investors or are, are borrowers are paying less over time. And then there's also some pent up demand from folks who might have been out bidding for houses six months or a year ago who view this as somewhat of, a, of an opportunity, you know, to, to go out and, and, and buy. Right. And, uh, you know, the other thing is a lot of other major capital expenditures were put on, on hold. People aren't taking trips or vacations. You know, car dealers were closed. Uh, people weren't doing home improvements in their house. So buying and so people, those people that, that were fortunate enough to have a job and continued income that might have been in the market for a house, they might have had some inadvertent savings, you know, coming out that would help propel them. And then they can buy the house a little bit cheaper because of low interest rates. So for those that are that were in the pent up demand stage, uh, this is kind of a, a, of a windfall for them for, for a limited period of time. Right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mike. I'm definitely going to be putting sure. all of your social media platforms on here so people can directly click on it. Uh, and then we'll also add your contact info so people can Great. ask any other questions. But again, we thank you so much for being a very valued uh, premier vendor for Cyria. We always enjoy uh, you coming out to our events, speaking, and just uh, uh, 
always representing us. So thank yeah. you for sharing with everybody. Thank you, Rachel. And thanks for all the good work that the folks at Syria do for all the real estate investors. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks.